Hello, welcome to our latest episode of Journey to Life with my co-host Constance Fields and yours truly, Arlette Jones Lawson. Uh, today, um, our topic is going to be trauma response. And we are honored today with our guest host, Erica Welsh. Erica is an associate marriage and family therapist, as well as an associate professional counselor. And thank you so much, Erica. Yeah. Take it away, Constance. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hi. Erica, thank you so much for being uh, a part of this discussion today. And, um, you know, we want to get started. I know part of what you do in the counseling profession is you, you counsel people who experience trauma. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask you was, can you explain a little bit about the way the body responds to trauma itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a few different diagnoses that you'll find in the DSM and just ones that are generally discussed that maybe haven't quite made it there yet. Um, but what's really interesting is um, all of these diagnoses are centering around feelings, right? Disruption of feelings, which gets stored in the body in a certain way. And so a lot of these things that um, end up being diagnoses kind of come back to just a basic disruption of affect disruption of emotional regulation, um, whether that means avoidance, right? We control, we want to avoid feeling something or we have too much of a feeling and it overwhelms us and we kind of drown in it. Um, but ultimately we're looking at, we're all humans and we all have nervous systems, which means that we are all capable of having a range of experiences and reactions from really any kind of um, experience in life, whether it's you know, a car slammed in front of me and I had to hit the brakes really fast and I'm okay. For someone that might be no big deal, right? They might just keep on moving and that's okay. You know, they, they forget about it pretty quickly and their body settles into itself into a more safe um, kind of state and regulated state is what we would call it. For some people that might be deeply activating and they might find it's really challenging to get back to feeling safe in their bodies again, which might look like, you know, elevated heart rate or just a sense of tension or fear in their, you know, in their bodies, whether um, it could be, you know, kind of anywhere. Um, it might look like thoughts or racing thoughts in our mind, you know, just not really being able to settle back into I'm safe, you know, I, I'm okay, things are okay now. And so our bodies do a really great job of letting us know that we don't feel safe. And so this looks like a really, you know, pretty wide range of experiences, depending on where one would fall, whether we're wanting to avoid and detach or we're kind of drowning in something, but mm -hmm. essentially our bodies are, are kind of the first place to let us know when something isn't going well or something doesn't feel safe. Um, so I'm really um, pretty big on describing that to clients and really focusing on, hey, how's your body feeling in this moment? Because mm -hmm. we're always going to be able to know if we're feeling safe or experiencing a moment as safe from the cues and this, you know, symptoms or just basic um, like mode of operation that our body's in the current moment. Um, I did write down some notes, just if you guys wanted to, you know, go through like some of the yeah. yes, absolutely. developmental stuff. Um, I think what often I see in a lot of clients are, you know, and, and depending on whether we're talking about an adult coming in Right, I just had a recent car accident that was really difficult. Or we're talking about a parent bringing a child in, um, or maybe even an adult who had traumatic events happen as a child. Um, they're going to experience both a range of different things and also very similar things, um, depending on what they lived through and and you know how their bodies responded. And so for some of these, you know, kiddos, we might see a teenager come in and a parent is saying, "Oh my gosh." Their temper is just out of control. They get angry so quickly. It feels like they go from zero to a hundred in like two seconds. What's going mm. on? You know, and we mm. go, oh, yes. You know, we, from a parent's perspective, it might be they have an anger issue. Mm. From a clinician's perspective, it's gonna, the question's gonna be more so, what happened to this kiddo that, you know, would create such a small window of um, being able to hold stress, right? If, some, if one thing's to go wrong in their day and they were to have this explosion, that's a sign, right? That their body is holding way too much. It doesn't know how to hold anymore. And we wanna be really um, respectful and responsible 
with that with that kid, even if we don't have any basic information off of, you know, what may have happened or what that kid's life has been. We know that someone coming in with symptoms like that, likely something didn't just happen yesterday that was kind of a mm-hmm. like a bummer, you know. Mm-hmm. We're gonna be looking at far, you know, bigger, you know, questions of um life, you know, development, childhood development, you know, kind of things like that. Um I think a big part of it really is gonna come down to just like affect regulation how we experience our feelings, what we do with them, and then how we put them onto others and um, live them out in relationships with ourselves and with others. And so that's kind of the general, I guess, umbrella right now of, you know, we're um, looking at just um, changes in your body, changes of your like normal regulated state. Um, That could look like, you know, someone saying I'm having nightmares. Again, I haven't had nightmares in so long. Um, I'm unable to focus um, at work. I'm having all these um, disruptive thoughts and images, you know, coming up and, um, you know, it's really hard to, to get them out of my brain to, in order just to focus it you know, on a task that I do every day that typically, you know, I, I'm used to being able to do. Um, we're looking at, you know, just things like that, um, that signal to us, the body is trying to tell us something and we need to pay attention. Mm-hmm. So for those that are um, on the, um, the uh, extreme end where their reaction to trauma is um, heightened and it's, they're in the position where the, it's like very difficult to get back to their normal, mm-hmm. um, their, their um, baseline normal. Mm-hmm. Um, for those people, is it like an automatic thing that they can um, link the, the trigger up to? I mean, or is that something that only comes from having someone kind of help mm-hmm. talk them through what the the um, the root of it mm-hmm. is? I mean, is that like something like right when they're in that car accident and and they're having a hard time getting back to base? Um, is that something that they can say, oh, it's because when I was a child, I was in this horrible boating accident, or is it, or is it something that they, they don't even connect? Mm -hmm. They just focus on the, the emotion and what they're going through. And that's not like an automatic connection. That's Mm -hmm. something that has to happen with the help of someone kind of talking them through it. Is that, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So I think in my experience, this happens in a, a really wide range, depending on the person and their lived experience. Um, if someone comes in as an adult with very few, you know, traumatic incidences as a kid, exposure to stress pretty low, um, that's kind of, you know, kind of a rare client in general, right? That they would have such a sanitized um, childhood, but say that that's the case. They come in, they've had, you know, they're, they're an adult and they've had a recent car accident that was really scary. And they're finding that they, they're maybe they came into therapy because, hey, I, I literally cannot get in my car. I don't know how to turn the car on and drive myself. And, and I've had some of those clients. And for them, it seems to be fairly um, recognizable, like where to connect the, you know, starting point, like the origin point of, of that stressor. What I have found, though, is if we dig a little bit more, even to those clients, it seems so, you know, um, simple and, you know, A plus, you know, one plus one equals two here. What we're talking about actually is an experience of, I don't know how to feel powerless and find my way back to safety. And so if we're talking about that, that likely could have happened throughout their life, not in a car accident situation, but maybe this is a, this was a kiddo who, um, was really high achieving and maybe they didn't have a lot of um, traumatic events in their life, but they still participated with themselves and the world in a certain way that avoided certain emotional experiences. And then all of a sudden we get to that car accident as an adult and then we need to go get back in the car as an adult, but yet we're now realizing, oh, I've never actually had the experience of working through feeling powerless and mm-hmm. having to get myself back to safety. I didn't have any of those as a kid. I didn't have any traumatic events maybe as a kid or very few far between that were very stressful. Um, but for some reason, you know, I'm getting stuck here. And so I'm finding that, you know, for, 
for those clients, it's really more um, about the emotional experience that's happening, right? Their body is telling them, I feel powerless here. I feel um, like something bad's going to happen, a sense of dread. Yeah. Um, I can't, I can't find my own agency here, you know, yeah. to keep myself yeah. safe. And we look back, oh, well, how did you keep yourself safe throughout your life? Oh, well, I controlled everything or I was perfectionistic or I made myself never quit, right? I never let myself quit. I never let myself, you know, have a hard day or, or just say good enough. I had to be perfect or, you know, that's kind of a general, um, I guess a really broad kind of way to talk about this, but it's, that's kind of the example of it could be more so someone's lack of what they had mm -hmm. when they were younger that creates um, a more challenging recovery process from even an adult like traumatic event. Um, and then there are the clients that absolutely, they, they're kind of coming in and they're just going, I don't know mm -hmm. what's going on. I'm just not okay. I, you know, it thinks just my body doesn't feel safe. I'm having these reactions or responses to things and it feels random. We know nothing is random. We know that everything is, you know, in context to something else. So we explore that. But so I, I think either way, we're still coming back to how do we cope with stress? Where do we find safety? How did our bodies get used to feeling safe in the world? Whether it was a helpful behavior or a not maybe safe, mm -hmm. I guess it was all helpful. It was all adaptive, right? Behavior right. was adaptive, but was it, you know, sustainable, safe behavior? And what are we doing now? Where are those behaviors and access to that safety and um, that lifestyle that we were used to having then? Like, where is that now? So I think it can kind of be a, a pretty big range depending on the client. Um, if that kind of helps to answer that, part of this. Question. That actually does. And it actually um, reminds me of a personal experience that I had back years ago. I was, I think, um, 19 or 20. And there was a lot of family deaths. I think it might have been, I don't know, maybe five or six back to back within less than six months. Um, um, and, and probably four of them were car accident related deaths and you know I was fine going about my daily life and I drove to work one day and was leaving work one day and got in the car and couldn't drive mm -hmm. literally couldn't turn the, the, the car on to drive I was stuck I mean I, I was stuck I was terrified mm -hmm. of putting the car in drive and moving and um, had to have someone come and pick me up because I couldn't do it but and and it, it didn't click on me because I didn't understand. But hearing you talk, it's it's that I related that to all of these deaths that were happening, and that was my body's way of saying, "Whoa, you have to deal with yeah. your death." Yep, there is something <laughs> conscious now happening, yeah. and here it is. And that yes. can happen at any point in time in our life, mm -hmm. completely unexpected. It's kind of a kind of a risky thing that we hold right our bodies hold things until it feels mm -hmm. maybe safe enough or that it just has to tell mm -hmm. us about something that we've been holding for so long mm -hmm. um, and so it, it definitely that is not abnormal to have it be very removed from the timeline you know from years decades even mm -hmm. that's not common well the majority of our podcast too is about sexual abuse trauma mm -hmm. and so um, I wanted to ask you um, knowing how our bodies respond to traumatic events or, you know, triggering moments that relate back to that traumatic event, how does that, how do those responses work when you're trying to build relationships with people and you're constantly being triggered? Yeah. I mean, so are you, I think what's interesting is, um, that people can respond in a lot of different ways, right? So just because someone has a certain experience in their life does not mean that they develop a traumatic response necessarily. It's something that we would call like a clinical traumatic response. Mm -hmm. um, it really matters how, um, so if we take that orig like origin instance and we ask the questions, who did you tell? How did they respond? What happened next? we will get a whole lot of information about probably um, what they're going to experience or how they are going to recover, you know, from that, um, from that situation or that event. It really matters that people um, believed us or that we had, we weren't alone in it and that we got the help that we needed. So if we've got that and we move into relationships as, you know, into 
later in life, we might not have as much of a um, sensitive trigger, you know, or kind of the, the, I kind of call it a trauma well, right? We might not have um, as deep of a trauma well that we get pushed into so quickly, right? We might kind of know it's there. Okay, let's respect that. Let's know that that's there. Let's be responsible. Let's be, you know, um, kind and maybe slow with certain um, engagements or certain activities. But in general, those people might find they have a buffer compared to people maybe who um, they didn't know how to tell anybody, or maybe they tried to and no one believed them, or it was just really confusing and overwhelming and they didn't know what had happened to them. We might find that those people moving into relationships in the future might have very different, both um, like relational and physical sensitivities that might make they might connect or it might just feel very random, right? Or preferences that they, you know, just assume this is just me, this is who I am. Um, and I think that it is important to offer people like a very wide range of, of what is normal or what is allowed or what is okay. It is okay that your body says, this doesn't feel good right now, or this is too much, or, you know, I can't do that yet, you know, and, and really validating that this is gonna be a process to heal. But I think in general, we're just talking about safety, right? The need to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that those um, safety gets found in a lot of different behaviors and things that we do or don't do, things that we try to do or try not to do and avoid, um, things that we move towards or move away from. And so ultimately our bodies, you know, in some way either um, looking for safety and we can do this and I think in two different ways, in a conscious way where we are actively working towards um, understanding what happened to us and looking to not reenact that experience, but to actually find a new corrective experience that is ultimately like healing and, and nurturing and um, validating. And also the other option is we're still looking for safety, but we're doing it in a more unconscious way by kind of reenacting what happened, the dynamics that happened to us before. We're looking to kind of resolve that in the present moment. And so, and I'm not really just speaking to bodies, I suppose it's kind of a both and like our bodies exist in, in us, right? Like, and we are with people and all of that kind of is, is all wrapped up together. And so often our bodies will move us, right? To, to act or to, to do something. And I think um, I would say in those two different ways, if we are conscious to what happened and we're consciously working on um, figuring out how to be in relationship with people, we might still have triggers, right? We're, we're, we likely will. Mm -hmm. That is normal. Um, we're not asking our bodies to forget what happened, you know, to, to it or to sanitize the story or the narrative we've lived. Um, we're looking to have a lot of like attunement with that and to validate and to be very um, respectful of of those experiences, but at the same time, those bodies, when they get stuck, because they don't understand what happened to them, and it's very confusing, sometimes we will recreate similar dynamics mm -hmm. of powerlessness or chaos or lack of safety, um, to and, and that will kind of perpetuate and continue, kind of almost like a re-traumatization of what happened then is gonna still happen now, because we don't have the ability to, um, to do anything different. Nothing has disrupted that yet. Okay. How's that sounding? Does that make sense? That was, that yeah. was great. That, that, was that makes great. total sense. <laughs> it makes <laughs> sense to me and like my head and I'm like, well, I don't know how it's sounding no, it to makes everybody total, else. It makes total sense. Um, I've written a book called um, There's More Beyond Surviving Journey to Life um, as an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, it's a self-help book, and one of the one of the um, chapters in it talks about uh, in the queue, talks mm -hmm. about things that are like queued up, mm -hmm. and their triggers, mm -hmm. and different things can trigger a memory or can trigger a feeling that's related to the um, the abuse. And so, no, absolutely, what you were saying absolutely ties into that. Yeah. Absolutely. And with that point, I think it'd be important for people to know um, just what that could look like. I mean, it can be something like a smell can mm -hmm. reactivate us. Um, if we're speaking to, you know, sexual abuse survivors, 
it's not out of the norm to either have repressed memories or to, you know, have very foggy or hazy dreamlike mm -hmm. um, images in our mind that we don't quite know what happened. And then sometimes as we get to a certain age or maybe even raising our own children, when they get to a certain age that might um, be tied to the age of, you know, their abuse, to all of a sudden have these memories become very clear and very mm -hmm. um, disruptive. And so those are, those are just, sadly, they're normal, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they can happen. And I think it would just be really important that um, we continue to normalize that those are things that happen. That doesn't mean anything um, was wrong with you or your brain or your mm -hmm. body. It was very mm -hmm. protective. And also, you know, there are moments in life that kind of just um, kind of shock, right? And it's kind of like, hey, mm -hmm. this in our brain mm -hmm finally has access to that or, or can bring mm -hmm. it back up. And so um, it can be really disruptive. It can be really traumatizing to have those things happen. And also if there is anyone, you know, listening, I would want them to hear, um, please don't do that alone. If that's something that has, you know, been a part of their story. Absolutely. Uh, and I think too, um, you know, it's, it's important that people realize that they need to feel safe enough with the person that they're building a relationship with. Mm -hmm. to do what you're saying, to, to, to do the, that work, to normalize their experience, but allow the person that they're trying to build a relationship with to go through the process with them. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that yeah. that person can respect that and, mm -hmm. you know, go through that journey with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that that, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do uh, therapy around this. Um, I've, there are, are very like rigid, you know, boundaries around one person. This is their therapy, you know, their therapy experiences, their healing journey. They figure it out. You know, there's couples, there's all kinds of different ways to, to bring people in. Um, one of the most um, powerful experiences I've, I've seen is with the therapist working with a survivor of sexual abuse and then having their partner come in and really being able to educate and teach and guide and explore <laughs> what support looks like in their relationship when they get to those triggering moments, um, whether it's something that they kind of know is a sensitive place or something that might just sporadically happen um, without you know them really seeing it coming. And so I think you know definitely bringing in the safe people in your life that can support and nurture um, and be very compassionate um, towards an activating moment or event would be really important in this. Very good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so what tools, um, Erica, can you recommend um, for those moments that trigger the traumatic memory? Mm -hmm. There are so many. Um, and so what I'm going to tell everyone is just that it's going to always start with your body. Um, it's the fastest way to get to safety um, is usually through your breath, right? You've got a nervous system, you're breathing is gonna you know take you up and like uh, escalate and fill you with energy adrenaline and cortisol or it can you know at the same time be completely depleted of energy and so our breath really is important to um, kind of modulate where we are and where we're going mm -hmm. on that spectrum and so we're usually um if something triggering is happening depending on the person they might go up where they're having that really rapid irregular breathing pattern for some people they went up and then they plummet straight down and they just you know they're dissociative or they're you know having a really difficult time of staying in their body or staying connected to the present moment either way we're wanting to start with breathing or maybe even like a little bit of um movement like body movement to get us back into like a safe space and so for those people that are really elevated it might be taking really um long inhales but more importantly, even longer exhales. So we're really wanting you to take that long extended amount of time to completely empty our lungs and have that off switch kind of come on. And sometimes as we're kind of releasing that breath, we might say something like, I'm safe, it's mm -hmm. over, you know, or we might look around and, and really start to feel, where am I? I'm in the room, I'm alone, there's no one else here. There's nothing happening. That was a scary moment. I'm safe, right? And so we might be saying that out loud. We might be saying that internally. 
depending on what we have capacity to do. Um, but either way, we're really focusing on getting our body to perceive and take in the information around us that we are actually safe. Because if we're not safe, right, if we actually are in a crisis situation, we don't need to slow our breathing down, right? We, we need that cortisol, we need that adrenaline. And so if we are in the car accident and we need to respond or get to safety or do something, we need that. So this is very much only in instances where we are actually safe, our body's just having a, a memory or a trigger of not being safe, something felt too similar to a previous incident. And so we want to really, you know, identify, am I safe? Is this a moment where my body needs safety and it doesn't have access to it? Or is this a moment where I need this, um, this energy in order to, to respond and to react? And so, so those that are elevated, it would be those like really long, you know, exhales that it's kind of what I call the off switch. Your inhale is your on switch, your exhale is your off switch. And so we're really going to focus on that long extended off switch. And then for people that might find they're at the other end of the spectrum, where maybe they detach really easily, they leave their bodies a little bit more quickly, they have a harder time staying um, with energy, then we might start to increase that breathing pattern. Can we go a little bit faster, right? Can we start to um, somehow like fill the body back up with a little bit of energy? It might even look like, hey, if, if you're having a hard time speaking, if you're having a hard time being here in this moment, can we just like wiggle a pinky finger? You know, can we just move it a little bit? Okay. Can we move the next finger? Can we Something start to get out? you more present, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But it's like, can we actually bring our focus to here in this moment in our body and wake it up a little bit? Hey body, we're here. I see you. We're here. We're all connected. We're trying to kind of bring that connect sense of connectivity um, and integration all like, you know, your body, your, your thoughts and your feelings all together again. Hey, okay. Can we move our hand? Yep, we can move our hand. Can we take that energy and transfer it up our arm? Can we move our arm? Yep, we can move our arm. And so this whole time we're trying to get that breathing increasing, trying to get our body moving a little bit to signal it's okay to come back up. It's okay to reconnect. You're safe. So it's still about safety. We're just um, different people's different um, people's bodies are going to do different things, whether they go up or they go down. The point is still to come back to the middle. Um, mm -hmm. the term we call it is, you know, get back into your window of tolerance is kind of the, um, the phrase that some clinicians will use or, you know, safety or let's get, you know, let's try to get your body regulated again. There are a lot of different ways I think to, um, to talk about it, but essentially it's your body needs to feel safe. So let's focus on the fastest way we can get to that. Just good enough safety. <laughs> and then from there, we've got a range of things, you know, <laughs> self-care and things to do next. But that initial yeah. kind of crisis, like at the escalation um, is going to be really important. And usually I find that, you know, breathing and different ways to support your body is going to be really important there. That's very interesting. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, interesting and it's I guess important that a person knows which which end of the spectrum they're on mm -hmm. because if you're already excitable mm -hmm. you don't need to do things that makes you more excitable right so, right if we're so, gonna, if we're escalated we don't need to keep <laughs> screaming like let's stop screaming right <laughs> exactly exactly uh -huh. and vice versa if you're already low uh -huh. you don't need to do anything to to, to make yeah. you lower yeah. so it's kind of yeah. like diabetics like you know, as a diabetic, you need to know whether your blood sugar is high or low, because mm -hmm. that's going to that's going to um, um, determine whether you need insulin or whether you need sugar. Yep, <laughs> exactly know? that. Yes, <laughs> yep. Do we need to come up or do we need to go down? <laughs> and, and and once we're at a certain point, you know, it's it's hard to get back in there. It takes a lot of work um, to get back to a safe place because our body is really, you know, deciding there is a bear coming to get me and I need, and it could be nothing, right? You could be sitting at home and maybe, you know, you just heard something and maybe you've got this memory of, you know, when you were younger, something bad happened when you were alone at home. And this is a similar sound. Immediately your brain has decided, this is as if a bear was coming, charging straight, straight at me. I need to figure out what to do. And so, you know, it takes a lot of effort and energy to be conscious of that shift and to recognize what's happening. And that takes a lot of, I think, practice um, mm -hmm. to slow those moments down enough to be able to catch yourself. Oh, I shifted, right? My my heart rate just increased. My body just got tense. You know, my thoughts are starting to race a little bit. The ability to track those things in real time, 
I think is one of the most important tools and it's a preventative tool. It's not something that you necessarily get access to in the moment when a trigger is happening, but it's a very preventative tool to know how to slow those moments down when you start to notice um, the escalation happening. So oh, um, <clears throat> moving on to another, another um, question. Um, I know that in my book, I talk about um, our behavioral change when you've experienced um, some type of trauma. Um, and in my book, I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, address sexual trauma, but that it's normal for your body, it's normal, it's normal for your behavior to change because you're changed mm -hmm. and it's going to change either one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can you know, become like hyperactive where you're like doing everything and you want to be successful in everything. And it's like, you know, or you can, you know, um, start doing the things that are destructive, but your behavior changes and that's absolutely normal. That's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes survivors turn to unhealthy ways of coping with um, the trauma that they've experienced. So what, what would you, um, how can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about it really accurately. When we have mm -hmm. something that comes um, towards us, something very stressful, we have to figure out a way to adapt to that experience if we did not know what was happening, right? If we we're younger and we've got something that is so overwhelmingly mm -hmm. confusing and painful and, and stressful happen, it has to go somewhere. Right. We, we don't just for, I mean, some kind of, you know, lock it away in, in a closet. And that's kind of what we call these like amnestic walls. They just forget about it and they move on as if like nothing occurred. And those, you know, can be very um, surprised like later in life by different things that activate that, like we were talking about earlier. Um, but for some kids they're you know, they're going to become more likely to be perfectionistic or have, um, you know, maybe more obsessive compulsive tendencies, um, their behaviors might become more rigid or more destructive, right? We kind of see a spectrum again. And again, depending on who responded to you, um, how you got support after that, what happened in the aftermath can really determine the spectrum of where we land on the extreme um, versions of behaviors changing. And so some, you know, get really tight and rigid and some move towards more chaotic and self-destructive and both are just different names for the same thing, which is survival and adaptation mm -hmm. to stress. Either way, what we're talking about when, when I talk about stress and when I think a lot of people who are um, more oriented towards um, like the nervous system responses, we're talking about a stress response. You know, that's what trauma mm -hmm. is. It's a, it's a spectrum of a stress response. We can have a moderate stress response, mild or, you know, very right. much extreme stress response. And it really, you know, that's what we're looking for with these behavioral changes. Are we having a mm -hmm. mild, moderate or extreme? Where are we? How do we support those things? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we look at, you know, disordered eating and exercising and how we spend our money and how we spend our time and how we're, you yeah. know, doing mm -hmm. work behaviors. Obviously, you know, it's okay to like want to do a good job at work and to be a good employee and to, you know, be reliable and highly thought of in your, you know, in your environment. And then we look at, okay, where are we on that spectrum though? Are we um, neglecting other things like, you know, time with our relationships, our important relationships? Are we, you know, neglecting ourselves, our physical, you know, health, our, our mental health? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. The behaviors on their own can mean very little. We really want to look at like what purpose are these behaviors serving like what's the root cause and and what's the the spectrum that they're landing on you know mm -hmm. i tell you know some clients um they'll come in oh gosh you know well, these things are happening right now i'm kind of in crisis and you know i cleaned gosh, i just like i had to clean my bathroom okay that's okay right <laughs> like you're allowed yeah <laughs> If, if something stressful is happening, we have to do something with it. It is okay to use something behavioral to move through it, right? It's okay to go move your body, clean your bathroom and find a little bit of agency in that day, right? If the world outside of you is chaotic, go clean your bathroom, like enjoy that. Maybe clean all your bathrooms, like that is okay, right? 
Okay. And then we would go more towards, um, okay, <clears throat> are you cleaning? Are, are you having a difficult time leaving your house or not going back to your bathroom after every single person is in there to tidy up, make it perfect yeah. and make sure there's no speck of dust and that's consuming mm -hmm. your right. life. Okay. Well, that's going to be a more extreme version of that behavior. That's going to be more disruptive, less sustainable, right? We are neglecting other parts of self. If right. that's where we're operating from and finding all of our safety, we want to really check in with that and support that person from, from there. And so I think it's important to look at behavior also like it's, it's normal and also it's a spectrum and it's okay mm -hmm. to have behaviors that help us feel stable when there's a crisis happening to us. What we would want to be mindful of is is the crisis over? And are we still doing the same exact mm -hmm. behaviors? Do we still have the same exact rituals? Mm -hmm. Are we still believing that we're needing them to be safe? And mm -hmm. that's a very different experience, I think, in context mm -hmm. that we would want to be really sensitive to and assess, you know, for um, what what is what is this client really afraid of? Or what is this person, you know, um, trying to control or hold so tightly to right mm -hmm. in this behavior what would happen if they stopped um, what feelings would come up what experience would they have and how do we kind of be very responsible with like modulating that you know that uh, exposure mm -hmm. we don't want to just take away usually things cold turkey and just say okay take put it down unless it's a very unsafe behavior sometimes we do that like with substance abuse or certain levels of disordered eating like we will physically intervene to stop a behavior to keep mm -hmm. someone alive but in general with you know clients that are more um maybe on the more moderate um side of you know of how they're expressing those behaviors um we might you know modulate that a little bit differently where you know it might not be a all or nothing so much even that even healing in that way can be a very overwhelmingly mm -hmm. um uh powerlessness you know experience uh, re-traumatization of sorts like experience mm -hmm. and we would not want to do that to people regularly in the healing journey we really want to be in that um, safe enough but challenged but not so overwhelming that you know we're having um, that same kind of activation in our bodies again trying to heal that's going to mm -hmm. go against what we're trying to do and right. so so we just want to be really careful that you know some of these behaviors um you can't just rip them away necessarily. Like, mm -hmm. if you rip those away, what does someone have to feel safe in the world? They'll go find something else. Right. We wanna be really careful with, with how we interact and support people through updating or changing our, I like to just say, we're gonna add some behaviors. We're gonna put all of the options on the table, <laughs> right? We're gonna have a table of tons of options. Some of those options will not feel, when, aren't necessarily the safe options, but we're not gonna control that. We're going to try to add as many options of how to get through a dysregulated moment as possible or a stressful moment as possible so that we are now familiar and more comfortable using the safer options and the other ones are there we're not going to put that like big red you know like x on those like don't touch it it's more so hey we have other options what do we want to choose what have we how have we found enough safety to choose the sustainable safe maybe newer options are we there yet can you know we support someone in in that experience rather than just taking away the behaviors right like the and we hear this often can't they just stop or like can't you just not do that thing <laughs> well they probably would have already done that right or something different would have happened if that was an option mm -hmm. whatever the whatever the behavior is you know can you just like not go to target after work <laughs> Like maybe they would have not been right. Like maybe they would have if that, you know, hadn't been something that was so deeply meaningful and like a ritual and gave them something back from, you know, going to Target every day after work or a stressful day or something. So, I mean, we're talking about very, you know, like harmless behaviors all, all the way to something that can be very life threatening. Either way, it's it's just a response to stress. Thank you, you for that. that. And, I, and I hear you say that it's important, though, to know when the crisis is over. Yeah. So when you can, like, yeah. go back to your baseline, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. We call it, um, well, at least how I kind of present it as we want to differentiate that the past is in the past and it is not in the future. And that can be incredibly challenging if we live with chronic exposure mm -hmm. to certain um, events where the world wasn't safe. We were mm -hmm. the victim most of the time, right? Like that was something that 
happen to us regularly that we now believe we need to be guarded for. Mm -hmm. That's going to be incredibly challenging to differentiate that the past is the past and that this could be a different um, opportunity or a different mm -hmm. experience in the world. And I mean, those things take a really long time for, for people who lived a whole life mm -hmm. with very much the truth of I'm not safe or I'm on my own or I have to fend for myself or people are going to mm -hmm. leave or people are going to die or bad mm -hmm. things happen to me or I make bad things happen. Yeah. You know, there are just all kinds of beliefs mm -hmm. that we hold that, I mean, that's really challenging. That's really hard work. Um, and, and healing to go through. And it's, it should be very incremental, you know, to get to the place where we can differentiate, oh, that's, that's not my reality anymore, or it doesn't have to be, or mm -hmm. maybe, or maybe the outside world is unsafe. Who's to say, but I can keep myself safe, even mm -hmm. if the world outside of me is not as safe as I would like for it to be. And so getting to that space, um, you know, we just really want to respect the time that it takes to be able to differentiate when someone has lived such a really challenging and um, uh, power, you know, powerless maybe childhood being mm -hmm. the like majority of their lived experience and how they grew up and how they came to be human. Um, that way, I think that would just be really important to have a lot of reverence for that process of healing. Yeah. Um you you mentioned re-traumatization and they got me thinking about um, this last question I had written down. You know, a lot of survivors don't let their families know what has happened to them or maybe years and years before the truth comes out. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, survivors, families do know what's happened and it's like a family secret or nobody talks about it. And that lack of acknowledgement can you speak a little bit of what you would recommend to a, a survivor who has experienced, let's say, childhood sexual abuse or um, something of that nature, and their family is aware but won't acknowledge what happened? So it's a re-traumatizing re event if they're having to constantly be around whoever abused them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... First thing that we would want to do that I do personally is just validate how incredibly difficult, right? That must have been to live through that. Um, we want to offer belief and support and kind of a safe place to really hear what it was like mm -hmm. for that person because how incredibly devastating to not be believed or to not have the support you needed um, mm -hmm. after something so challenging. And so I find that that is our first step and we might stay there for a while right we might stay in that conversation for for a long time just to um kind of hold what has not had a chance to be seen and given attention and validation mm -hmm. uh, before um ideally we would get you know to boundaries this idea that um by continuing to be around people that either cannot validate our experience or who um cannot offer a safety in any capacity, right? Like why would we, why are we continuing to show up there? What are we trying to resolve that they cannot give us? Mm -hmm. And that is deeply like painful work and, you know, conversations to have with people mm -hmm. because we're having to acknowledge the loss, the like mm -hmm. overwhelming, right? Desire that often people have to be connected to their families mm -hmm. and then to grieve the loss of, what, why can't we have that, you know? Um, that is deeply painful. That is just, you know, a lot of brief work there that um, takes time and really challenging. But I think um, I would want people to hear on their timeline, right, when they're ready, if they wanted to move towards a different way to be in relationship with those people, that would be completely understandable and fair mm -hmm. and maybe even good for them. Um, to discover new ways of not necessarily, we're not talking about always cutting people off or having these rigid, you know, like mm -hmm. can't talk to you, won't see you ever again relationships. It might just be different versions of boundaries that maybe have never been there before. Um, often family dynamics play into how we respond to crises. And if something big happens, but we're a family that 
doesn't talk about things or we're a family mm -hmm. that values peace or we have to all be connected no matter what. We can never have like a rift here or not be in relationship together. Mm -hmm. We're going to respond from that place. And so kind of how we describe it is a crisis brings the family's dysfunction to the surface, right? Because we're in crisis mode. So we're going to grab the things that help us feel um, more sturdy when things are feeling unsafe or distressing. And so a family has their own version of that, right? Each family is kind of like nuclear family, you know, extended family will have their own kind of rules and kind of the dance, right? That they do mm -hmm. and these things happen. But what that means is whatever it is they use that is dysfunctional or um, maybe not safe, emotionally safe, um, will be the things that rise to the surface and will be the things that they grab on to, to sturdy the ship in their crisis. Um, and for oftentimes like what you're describing is sometimes people do not get the validation mm -hmm. or the space they need or the support they need to resolve like what happens. So the aftermath, like we were talking about earlier, is actually sometimes more difficult than the instance itself because that was already awful, but now we're alone in it. And the people we mm -hmm. thought would be there to protect us and to, you know, take us in and, and help us aren't there. So then we have to experience that sense of aloneness and abandonment with the people we thought we were safe with. And that can be even more traumatizing than sometimes the actual event of, you know, whatever that was. Well, wow. thank you so much for, for that answer. I mean, this whole conversation was completely valuable. And my hope, and I know my mom's hope, is that um, it touches whoever hears it. Yeah. and that they get something out of it and that whoever's listening if you all have a therapist can find a confidant someone who can walk with you through this journey that you have on on your healing um it's important yeah, absolutely that's the finding a safe <clears throat> excuse me finding a safe space person mm -hmm. finding a safe safe space person um, is absolutely necessary. And you only need one. Mm -hmm. um, it's whoever that is. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely. And, and Erica, was there anything more that you wanted to share that our questions didn't um, afford you the opportunity to share? Yeah. I mean, I think we could probably talk for days, right, about this topic. I think that this is a really great start. I think if anything, it would just be, you know, this kind of work just takes time and to be um, incredibly compassionate and patient with yourself um, if you're on this journey or if you're thinking about starting, you know, healing from certain things that happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, it is my deep, 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 you know, belief that um, there are, you know, no bad people, right? Like no bad kids. If you were a child and something happened to you, it was not your fault. Um, you know, you were not bad. And that there is a path forward, I think, to help maybe consider that if that's not something that you hold um, inside of yourself, um, but maybe that can be an invitation to begin like a work that you don't have to stay in that space, which is often something that is taken from us when we're little and things happen to us is a sense of, am I, am I good? Am I bad? What, what was that? Who, you know, am I worth loving? Um, and so I would just really want to invite people into, you know, a space, um, where they could really explore that and maybe find new answers to those questions. Very good. Well, Erica, we have absolutely enjoyed your presence and your wisdom um, and all of the, the good nuggets that you put out there. And yes. for our listeners, we are just very hopeful that, that you've heard things that um, that are going to help you move forward in your healing process and know that you're not alone and a lot of what you're feeling is normal and if you need help working through it there's help available out there definitely so much and and i you know kind of say just get started just reach out to somebody and just ask hey can you help me with this right if it's a therapist profile online if it's you know somewhere just somebody a friend whoever just a helping person hey can can you help me with this and just you know get it started absolutely, absolutely. thank you
Thank you guys. This was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I hope you. It will be helpful to people. Yes. <laughs> so this concludes our episode and um, and thank you for listening. Stay tuned for the next topic. Bye. Yay. Bye.